Hi, Dr. Jones. Thanks so much for speaking to us. My pleasure, sir. It's very nice to meet you. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your time and all your work throughout your career. Thank you so much for fighting the good fight for all Americans, especially mm. those who need it the most. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'll just get right into it. Uh, when you went into law school and started your legal career, uh, did you anticipate that you'd be using your legal skills on behalf of the civil rights movement? Or did you go uh, trying to make some money? No, it wasn't interested. My primary objective was not to make money, although that was a, uh, an obvious concern. My, my principal objective was to develop my skills as a, a musical, into musical uh, copyright. I had, uh, uh, that's what I want, that's, that's what I, when I graduated law school, that's, that's what I was all um, hot and ready to try, was musical copyright infringement. Oh, well, okay, let's, let's go back a little bit then. Then what did you do as your undergrad? Well, I went, well, I went to, uh, uh, I went to Columbia, uh, College of Columbia University, but I also went to the Juilliard School of Music. Oh, wow. And I had become, and I had become a, a professionally trained classical clarinetist, uh, uh, Juilliard, and as uh, it's not relevant to this, but when I was 17 years old, I had the bejesus scared out of me because I had to, I was asked to sit down and play with Charlie Parker. No 17 year old young clarinetist should be put through that, uh, <laughs> uh, through, through, through that terror. Well, that's amazing. At yeah, it is amazing when I think about Parker. it. Is, is there a recording of it? No, in fact, uh, I have been looking for a recording. Actually, I've been looking for a recording of on what was then the station WKNEW in Philadelphia, when you can believe it, when I was 17 years old, played Flight of the Bumblebee on the clarinet. So you know oh, I wow. must have been bad. Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to waste valuable time on that, brother. You know. No, Dr. Jones, your life is not wasting time at all. This is what people want to know. They don't get to know about this stuff. In fact, if yeah. anyone out there is watching this who has connections with uh, what was that radio station you, you just said? W, it was then called WNEW. Okay, well, if anyone has any connections to that, maybe the internet can help solve this. We would love to find a recording of Dr. Jones playing with Charlie Parker. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and uh, I'm sure you get asked this a lot because um, I, I myself uh, kind of went from uh, graduating from law school into stand-up comedy. So sometimes I get asked this a lot and it's, it, 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 it's always a kind of weird question to answer. But So I hope you indulge me. But um, how did you go from... Juilliard clarinet, which is no joke. I mean, that's not a, you know, I mean, Hello. that's not an amateur music school. That's probably Hello. the best music school in the world, which right. takes a lot of dedication, a lot of talent to get into. Right. How do you go mm -hmm. from that and then going into law, which is obviously a very different, uh, totally different path? Well, uh, I didn't intend when I when I when I went, I went to Boston University Law School. And my professor was professor of copyright law was impressed because I got one of the top grades, if not the top grade in copyright law. And he says, well, geez, you seem to have a skill set in this. And I and then I let him know a little bit more of my background. He says, oh, the bottom line, he arranged for me to get a position coming right from law school to go out to California to work for a company called Review Production, which is now known as Universal Pictures. And so uh, that I, I was interested in uh, putting it bluntly. I when I went from law school, I was interested. I was no, no civil rights, no criminal law. I was interested only in musical copyright law infringement and entertainment. That's all I was interested in. Sure. And obviously, something happened while in law school that set you on the path of fighting for civil rights. No. Oh, okay. Nothing well, happened. To, no, well, no. I mean, I was interested in criminal law. No. It was nothing that happened in law school. Okay. It, okay. it was after I got out of law school and um, and I foolishly uh, 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 responded to a call from a judge in New York who told me that Dr. King had been indicted by the uh, state of Alabama for tax uh, evasion. And, um, and he had respect for my legal skills, not so much for my musical clarinetist skills. But anyway, he says, I was living in California. And he says, I, I'm, I'm the chief counsel. I have uh, four other lawyers working with me, but I really would feel very confident if you would 
take over the responsibility for doing the legal research for the defense team. Now he's in New York and I'm living in California, right? right. So I thought immediately, well, okay, I go to law library and he said, no, 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 no. To do this, you actually have to come east and go to uh, Birmingham, Alabama, where the trial is taking place. And I said, I, I, no, no, I can't do that. I can't do that, Judge. You know. And sorry, Dr. Jones, roughly what year was this? Oh, not roughly. I can tell you, 19, uh, it was 1960. 1960s. So this was back to be the second week in February, 1960. So, so, so in those times, I'm, I'm, this is a sincere question. I promise you, Dr. Jones, like, can you speak a little bit about what it was like to have to travel around the country? Cause it obviously wasn't as easy as it was now. You know, you kind of book a flight on your phone, you jump on a plane and you land. Like, what was the traveling like? Like if you went to California and you had to go to Alabama or go to New York, you know, was that like a, was it a trek? Well, yeah, once, you were, once you were in a place, you traveled by car, right? Right. But going from state to state, yeah, it was like, you know, you traveled by, mostly in those days, it was by train or, 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 or bus. Right, so it was a trek. I traveled, I traveled mostly north of what is called the Mason-Dixon line. Mm -hmm. But when I went south, for those of people who know what the Mason-Dixon line, was that was a shorthand term, like a line drawing, imaginary, what was it so imaginary, a line going through the country mm -hmm. where they had segregation, where they imposed a racial segregation by law. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that happened. If you, if you win New York and you went to Alabama, you abided by the laws of segregation. And if you didn't, you get your, your, your head stomped and your butt kicked. Right, so it was, a, it was an ordeal to travel around and ask you to go oh, for yeah. these things. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> No, I just want to make no, that clear. No, no, for the no I don't mean that. No, I mean I appreciate. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes we I take it for granted. Around. I think we take it for granted now. Traveling around yeah, no, America. Thank I you think. so much. Yeah. Sometime, I, yeah, my beloved uh, colleague uh, Jonathan Greenberg. I say, you know, people forget. You know, the reality is, I mean, yeah, I've been fortunate to live ninety years old, but you know, I've seen a lot in this ninety-year-old journey. And one of the things I've seen that doesn't, has not, a, did not obscure my vision, a dull my memory, is the entrenchment of racial segregation in this country. Anybody who talks around it, or talks like it didn't exist, it's just nonsense. That's why I, I it, 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 it's, it, it's beyond my comprehension. It's literally beyond my comprehension that in 2021, 2020, that hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars would be spent in either trying to prove or disprove the consequences of the legacy of slavery. I'm saying, give me a break. I mean, with all due respect to the 1614 project or whatever it is, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, but do you, you mean to tell me that all of that talent has to be put to test it to prove a reality. That's like proving air. You know? Yes. That's like proving yes. water exists. It is. It must and be we frustrating. Still, to, yes, we still have to do it. Uh, it must be frustrating to have to prove to things to people that stuff that you lived through and yeah. saw. And, I know. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> all right. You know? um, and then, no, and, and I mean, and, and, and Ronnie, to even, even to have it challenged. Yes, you know? yes, yes. It, 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 I can only imagine how frustrating that is. I mean, I'm, I'm already, I'm trying to prove things to people that are present in modern day, like that vaccines Were you born in the United States? Frustrated. Were you born no, in sir. the United States? No, sir, no, sir. Where, where were you I was, born? I was, I was born in Malaysia. Malaysia, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you have yeah. a, that's good. No, I'm glad you were born in Malaysia because they give you a, you know, I mean, it gives you a, a, a view of how to look at the United States outside itself. I, I, no? I hate to pat myself on the back, but Dr. Jones, I agree with that. I think it gives me a little bit more perspective. Um, also, because I'm here in America by choice, um, I'm, I am very hopeful about America. Uh, at the same time, I've seen the way they do things in other countries. And sometimes, you know, I think that there's stuff you can, America can also learn from other countries in terms oh, of no question how, about the, it. 
yeah, yeah. So a little bit of perspective. I think a little bit of perspective never helps. And that's why we're talking you to you today because you have so much perspective on the history of civil rights in America. And yeah. I think that perspective is very useful to have. And it's something right. we don't get the chance to hear enough about. So just, just on that note, I mean, we could talk about, you know, your, the day-to-day -day experiences. I'm always interested in American history. So I'm always interested in day-to-day -day experiences. Uh, that's why I was asking about logistics. Uh, but on, on a completely separate note, uh, maybe we'll just get into one of the, one of the more, uh, I think what everyone really wants to hear is like, uh, what was it like to be Dr. King's primary lawyer? Um, can you talk a bit about that working environment and the teams well, of, me, I'm glad, teams of I'm people glad, you assemble? I'm glad you asked that question. I get mm -hmm. asked it sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. King, um, he would his 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 re, his response to that. He would tell me this after he had been asked, and then I'll tell you how I feel. He would he would say, "Well, you know," he would say, "Well, you know, people." People talk to him and say, you know, Dr. King, um, uh, I understand that this uh, fellow you have, Clarence Jones, that he's a very nice man and a very able lawyer, and uh, and people say he's a good speechwriter. But you know, but you know, you can do better than that. I mean, that's what suggests about. And Dr. King's response would be like, uh, well, you know, uh, he would like speak for me. He would say, you know, if I was speaking with Clarence, he'd, be, he'd, say he'd probably be the first to acknowledge. He'd probably be the first to acknowledge that the lawyers that are uh, probably better than him and so forth. And, uh, and as for uh, his speech writing and being uh, my lawyer, he says, you know, I frequently get suggestions of people I should uh, undertake or bring on to replace Clarence or to work with Clarence in addition to Clarence. He said, but I asked him one question. You know, there's one question that, uh, before I even talked to any possibility, Clarence has a quality that, uh, uh, that has intrigued me. And they would say, well, what's that? He says, I trust him. <laughs> End of story. Which, which goes a long way. Yeah. Which goes a long I way. I trust him. Um, I, sure. And, and I guess, like, for most every, most human beings, we kind of never got to meet Dr. King personally, and we only know him from, you know, his speeches and archival videos and him in public speaking mode and photographs and obviously written stories. So I guess if you could, as someone who was around him all the time, if, could, could you, I, I don't know, kind of give us an idea of what he was like in day to day life, his energy. Okay. What, Factually, what, I don't want to, I don't want to overstate the case. I don't, I wasn't around him all the time. Sure, sure. I was around him a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you observe people. First of all, I observed things that maybe other people wouldn't see. Let's talk about the concept of fear and fearlessness. He was five foot seven, five foot eight, right? Now, I've, I've been experienced in the North in which I had heard, you know, Negroes, as we refer to myself, talk about how bad they were, what they're going to do to the man, blah, blah, blah. They're going to kick the man's butt, you know? Now, I'm not going to say to you, Dr. King would be the first to acknowledge that he had fear, but he was fearless. I mean, that's what impressed me about the brother. He was fearless. Now, I don't know whether he was fearless because he was crazy. I mean, I used to think he was fearless because he was crazy. <laughs> I really did. I think that's just some crazy Negro preacher. And then I began to know that he's fearless because he really believes this. I mean, this is no joke. He really believed that there's no nothing no human being can do to him to make him afraid. They can make him momentarily afraid because he has such an abiding, and it's very hard for those of us today to understand. See, we're all caught up in this internet. People don't read anymore. <laughs> he was so deeply embedded in, 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 in his biblical teachings. He was so deeply embedded 
in the, in the teachings and wisdom of people over the years that all of that got into his bloodstream, okay? So uh, I, I say to people, if you don't read, you're gonna be afraid. Want to become fearless, read. Learn something about the history. And aside from, uh, you know, the, the, the doctor was a doctor, uh, the, uh, you got a PhD in divinity. So he had, he had a uh, encyclopedic knowledge of the Bible and of the Talmud, the Jewish uh, religious tome. And his, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Howard Thurman, who was Dean of the uh, uh, School of Theology at the Boston University Law School also became the leaders of what was called the liberation theology, a new kind of theology within the church, you know, a church that looked at theology as a, as a method of teaching their commitment about their religious, so we're looking at the theology as a platform of liberation, not to go to church, put on your shirt and tie and cufflinks and fancy cars, but look at theology as a, as a method of defining your life. And so his fearlessness came from his, Dr. King's fearlessness came from his deep abiding religious commitment. And, and, and once, you, once, you, once you get over that, once you get over that, I didn't get over, very few of us got over, okay? Once you got over that, well, what can you say? Once you accept the fact that you can die at any time, well, what can they say? You know, they can't kill you a thousand times, they only kill you once. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I guess, so what you're saying is that was the energy you felt from him. That was one of the strengths oh, you felt from him oh, that allowed oh, him to oh, oh. do me, what he me, did. Was... I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to put it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to put it without being overly dramatic. I mean, yes, I had a religious background raised by uh, Irish nuns and a Catholic boarding school and all that stuff, but I don't know how to put it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to put it, what? except that there's something uniquely in that gets inside of you when you deeply believe in the religion to which you are committed. Okay, sure. and it may sound corny, and it may sound just one-handed, but he he literally believed that what he called his Lord Jesus Christ could protect him. He didn't have to worry about anything else. Hmm. Sure. Um, you know, honestly, we could talk like it, 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 all of your answers could be, you know, an entire day's conversation on its own. So unfortunately, Funny, if I may, would, if I may inter uh, uh, briefly interrupt, I know you're doing the interview, but you know, I also Please. think there's a crossover between Dr. King's commitment and to the philosophy of the monks, you know? There's a deep abiding philosophy of, of, of people who enter the monastery to be to be to be monks, you know, particularly particularly in Asia, you know. I mean that was that sure. was the score for that, that that remains the the sore spot with China today. There's nothing nothing China can do that's going to change the mindset of a, um, a small little country, you know, which is really a religious state. There's nothing going to do. Yeah, the I guess the idea I, I guess you're referring to like that Buddhist idea of um, that's what I was thinking uh, about, yeah. right? Living in the moment and right, um, uh, not worrying about material uh, goods and, goods, and right. kind of focusing right. on your on your on, on your purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I can see it, and and that's what's really interesting because um, I guess in many ways Dr. King was kind of like a, a modern day monk in many ways. Thank you. Know, his, you. his yeah, his strength of character and and yes. kind of his commitment to the cause and almost uh, he could uh, and I'm asking you from what you're telling me it sounds like he could he, he could. Ignore... I walk around sometimes, Lonnie. I walk around sometimes. Don't ask me when it occurs. Periodically, I walk around with a picture in my an actual visual picture of Dr. King and the Dalai Lama in my head. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Listen to what I say now. Listen to what I said. This African-American, 90 years old, periodically doing his journey, trying to understand. The only way you can understand it is to put them two together, then you understand it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, well, like I was saying before, uh, you know, we could talk about any, any, any of those little anecdotes you just gave is like a full day conversation on its own. But unfortunately, we kind of have to jump around here because you've had a long history in civil rights. So we, we're trying, I'm trying to talk a little bit about everything and give okay. people a, a taste of it. And I wanted to kind of move on to talk about your experience with um, this, the person this award is named after, uh, Justice uh, Thurgood Marshall. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you started to your experience with him, uh, with Justice Marshall? Well, the, um, my experience with Justice Marshall is really ironic. Is that in a summer internship, of 1957, when I was after my first year in law school, just to make a long story short, I found myself being a summer intern at the NAACP headquarters in New York, and I interned or a couple of others, but I interned for Thurgood Marshall, who was at the director council long before he ever went on the bench. And, um, and that was an extraordinary experience. And in the interest of time, I'll just say that uh, he sent me to the research, to, the, to the, the library on 43rd Street, where his offices were, to, to get some legal case backup for a position he wanted to argue. And so I spent the whole day in the library and came back and told Justice Marshall, uh, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't find anything uh, in the library. And this is before, for those of you law students, you have this thing now, I don't know, it's automatic. There you had to go the old fashioned way. You go and you read the case, you you read it, you cited, you did it. You didn't have any kind of- Yeah, we special. don't do that anymore. <laughs> okay. No one's reading no, the case. That was the old fashioned way. So <laughs> Justice Marshall, I come back to him and he he put his he pushed his glasses down on the nose, looked like this, and he says, "Excuse me, you mean to tell me, in all of those thousands of law books and thousands of cases in the law library, you didn't find one case to support the proposition?" So I got a little easy. I said, "Well, I'm not sure." He said, "Well, you go back and look tomorrow." And lo and behold, tomorrow I found out. <laughs> he wanted it, okay. So it was. Uh, it was an extraordinary. He was an. Ex that was that. That was the first personal experience I had with him. I think and all the I, lawyers. I think all the lawyers out out here listening to this love the old school lawyer stories of having to do actual research and oh, answering oh, answering yeah. to someone who, when you are first right. of getting involved in law, and them kind of pushing you. Oh yeah, you couldn't. Yeah, you had to do it, right? Because I think it, it kind of it kind of um, elevates the profession into a profession. It's not just something you oh, can, yeah. you know, read a summary about. You have to know a lot of cases. Yeah, it's, you know, it makes, what you're looking it, you know, for. You have to understand the, how to argue. That's when the, that's when the study of law crosses over to Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> you know? right? Because you're, uh, you're a good looking looking for research. And it's a supported case it's like Sherlock Holmes, you know, looking for a clue. Only you're um, doing it not with Nexit, Flexit, or whatever it's calling, you know, you're doing it the old fashioned Nexus, Lexus. Yeah. The old fashioned way. It shows you, it shows you how removed I am from reality. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, you, you've, you've worked with so many of these leading civil rights lawyers, and we can go through all these names, even people who maybe aren't as high profile, who you probably highly regard as well. Um, you know, Justice Marshall as a litigator, one example, Dr. King as an example. I, uh, I, I'd just like to ask you, with all the civil rights lawyers that you work with, um, the leading civil rights lawyers of the 20th century, including yourself, would you, did you find any common kind of quality that you saw in all of them? They're obviously all very different people and characters, but did you see, was there any kind of common thing that kind of stood out to you with all the people you've worked with? some kind of common quality or value. And, in, and implacable, now this is the dialectic of it, right? And implacable respect and disrespect for the law. 
That's the dialectic of it. Okay. Otherwise, otherwise, if you're looking, if you're looking to overturn, I mean, you're looking to overturn uh, segregation in public schools. Okay. Well, you have a leading case, Plessy B. Ferguson. Okay. I mean, you, you have, you know, you, you, you have Justice John Harlan's dissent and Plessy B. Ferguson. You have, you have all the legal research that went into support that decision. Okay. And so you have to decide in trying to overturn that. You want to overturn, you're overturning centuries of so called supporting doctrine to support that decision. You want to overturn that, right? And, and, and lo and behold, ironically, it's not the, although it was helpful, it's not the accumulation of the legal cases that did it. It's two psychologists, Dr. Mamie Clark and Kenneth Clark, who did something called the doll test. Okay, took, took some white dolls and brown dolls and put them before the students and asked them which doll is the beautiful doll, which doll is the ugly doll, which doll would you like to grow up to be, which doll? And the results of the doll test is what persuaded the court on separate but equal. You know, when I teach, when I teach, I say, you know, the South is stupid. If the South was really interested in maintaining segregation, they would have made equal facilities. Okay? They would have said, we're going to spend ten thousand dollars per pupil or whatever it is for a white student, and then we're going to spend ten thousand dollars for a black student. But no, they didn't do that. They wouldn't spend ten thousand dollars for a white student and three thousand dollars. Well, so, so nowhere could be equal. So they shot themselves in the foot. Anyway, it's about Thurgood. Thurgood Marshall is you know there's a time in history when events in time intersect to define a man's or a person's journey, and Thurgood Marshall is the same. And there's events in time. Now, who? How would I know that the only child of the living domestic household servants taught raised by Irish Catholic nuns would end up being the principal lawyer and jazz speechwriter for the greatest person in the 20th century. How, how, who, who could predict that? Okay. And who could predict that, you know, I want those of the lawyers who hear this, I'm not trying to disrespect your legal education or my legal education, but I think I was blessed. I think the combination of having gone to the Juilliard School of Music, the ability to develop a, an extremely retentive memory, not only quantitatively, but the tenure, you know, you hear things, okay? So that it's not just being able uh, to recall the exact words. That's not it. It's to recall the tenor of how they sounded within the context in which they occurred. And that's one of the, I mean, when I drafted things for, for, for Dr. King, I drafted things that I thought he should say, not what I would say. I drafted things that were, I thought that would fix it, that would be consistent with the tenor and cadence of his voice. I could not have done that had I not developed the skill set of retaining sound and cadence in my mind. Well, no, that's great. I love that. I love that. I mean, that's, that's, it sounds so obvious in hindsight, but I think that's a great argument. One thing for having, having a life and having an interest uh, right. outside of law and you never know what skill sets you bring into another uh, yeah. context. In your case, you brought music to the civil rights fight. And it, it right. sounds like such a bizarre uh, combination. I mean, look at yourself. It, do you ever think you would do, leave law school and become a stand-up comic? No, I didn't. I, I, I couldn't get a job, so I went to go to a stand-up company instead. But, um, you know what I'm yeah, saying? But, uh, yeah, I, exactly. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Um, that Yeah, and, and it makes so much sense to me now hearing you talk that, of course, of course a Juilliard musician was Dr. King's lawyer. Of course, the Juilliard trained musician was a speechwriter for Dr. King. In hindsight, so, in hindsight. <laughs> in hindsight, yeah, yeah. 
but it makes so much sense. And because, uh, the, you know, not only, not only the tenor, as you're talking about, just not only the specifics of writing musically and speaking musically, both in speeches and in, in court and litigation and what you write, but just seeing the beauty in humanity, which is right. what music is about and being able to see the, the you know, being able to see, uh, be optimistic in the face of just, just but you also oppression. Have to, but you also have to have a kind of underlying design and understanding of what you're doing, okay? Okay? And this may take us in the controversy, just the understanding. You've got to understand the nature of power. P-O-W-E-R. You cannot be an effective lawyer in the civil rights movement. Maybe you can't even do it in corporate law, but I can tell you in the civil rights movement, you can't do it unless you sit back and reflect on the dimension of power. And you can't do that unless you go back to the well of Frederick Douglass. Power can seize nothing without a demand, never has it, never will. You got to understand the dimensions of power. Otherwise, you get overwhelmed and you get too much respect for power. And you believe that, uh, oh, well, it's, it's this way because it's always been this way. Now, I don't want to, we don't have time to go off on the circuit court. That's why, you know, that's why. Do not waste my time talking about Dr. What he thought about this and whatever. I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm 90 years old. And anybody who can come and give me a, a cogent argument based on historical facts that reparations is not an appropriate <laughs> remedy for the consequences of slavery, then I'm, I, want to, I want to hear it. I'm willing to hear it because I have not seen it anywhere in my 90 year old journey, anywhere. That's because you wanna, you wanna address something, you do it with power. Yeah, well, that, that makes sense. And that's and also, that's something I think we all might understand intuitively, but coming from- Excuse you, me, nonviolent power. For sure, <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> but coming from you, it means it means a lot more just because you've seen it all, you know. And so, right. I, I, like I was trying to say, like we, I think we all understand that intuitively. But coming from you, it means more because you've seen it in action and you have perspective to kind of, you know, you, right. you, what 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 your perspective lends a lot of weight to your opinion. Um, and just on that, uh, that means if you live long enough, you people respect you, right? <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> It can, it can Not necessarily, I got it. Yeah, um, uh, but, but on that note of uh, non-violent, um, non-violence, I just wanted to maybe um, see, uh, ask you if you could help, just help us connect the dots a little bit between like, what was the relationship between the uh, NAACP's Legal Defense Fund um, and Dr. King's non-violent campaigns okay. um, in, in uh, the cities, yeah. Montgomery, yeah. Albert, Albert, I don't need to tell you, was, cities, was, you, you know the cities, <laughs> but just if more, you could connect the dots, yeah. Yeah, it was more a de facto relationship. In fact, I don't remember, I think it was 1962, we looked at the Inc. Fund and we, when I say we, we in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, we created something called the Gandhi, the Gandhi Society for Human Rights, Inc., which was intended to be like the uh, tax-exempt equivalent of the uh, NAACP Inc. Fund. Uh, because we understood that what uh, the NAACP Legal Education Defense Fund, Inc. was able to do, it was able to amass sums of money through a tax exempt entity to support the legal fight. So we said, oh, okay, that's, that's what the NAACP should do. So we should create the equivalent, okay? I was the first president I'm sorry, I was the first executive director of the Inc. Fund, okay? We wanted to uh, use that as, a, uh, 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 as, an example, as an example, as an exemplar. And, you know, history. Oh, thank you for correcting me. Yeah, 
I would thank, uh, yes, I was executive director of the Gandhi Society for Human Rights. God knows, I, the end, people from the NAACP Inc. Fund would chop my head off if I said otherwise. <laughs> but I use, but all I'm simply saying is that we use the Inc. Fund as an example. And I was the executive director of the Gandhi Society. So that's what we, we because we were trying to, a little bit off. See, when, when we were sued in 1960, and I don't want to remember the exact date, 1960, 62, when we were sued along with the New York Times for libel, for uh, in, uh, the classic case of Sullivan versus the New York Times, the New York Times and their lawyers looked on this classically as just a, you know, uh, a legal case. We looked on it differently. We knew that we had to defeat this case because the that the, the, the segregationists were going to was trying to use the law of libel to destroy and decimate the civil rights movement. We considered we considered uh, uh, Ronnie. The, the that lawsuit to be the most serious threat to the civil rights movement. And so I was charged with coordinating the defense of that and, uh, and successfully uh, working with the, the lawyers for the New York Times. We were able to get it overturned in 1964. That's great. So, <laughs> right. That's because you guys are great lawyers. Could you connect the dots between the uh, legal defense fund and Dr. King's nonviolent movements? As in, how did they actually like? What was the relationship between the two? Well, there was a first. There was a uh, cooperative working relationship. It was not a competitive relationship. Uh, we used the the Inc. Fund, as it was called, as an exemplar initially. As I said in nineteen. 60, whenever, we, whenever it was, 1962, we mm -hmm. formed the Gandhi Society of Human We came to respect and had great admiration. In fact, in fact, personally, as I write about in my memoirs, I mean, can you imagine walking up the steps of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, where you have a Constance Baker Motley on one side of you, and uh, maybe, maybe Norman Amaker or maybe one of the, but I remember walking up the fifth, the, fifth, the, the steps of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta, uh, since before Constance Baker Martin became a judge herself to go order to overturn, I think it was overturned an injunction in the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals oversaw uh, several circuits and coups, including uh, to Alabama, Louisiana. Uh, one of the most extraordinary events just the mere walking up the steps, the mere walking in the courtroom with Constance Baker Motley, and then get to know persons like uh, 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 Jack Greenberg and Norman uh, Amaker, and one of the and their godfather was Derek Bell, who used to be in my home in New York. You know, I mean, I I was able to drink, I was able to drink from the well of the work of Thurgood Marshall, as all so many other people in this country. I am, uh, I don't know whether you've seen my acceptance speech, but I'm, 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 I'm humbled. In fact, the first thing I thought when I heard I had gotten the award, I went on the internet and saw how many people by the name of Clarence Jones at 98 were still living. <laughs> Because I figured it's got to be, it's got to be a mistake. <laughs> it cannot be intended no, for me. No, sir. There, no, sir. I there's knew. no mistake here. No, but no, because I knew, and I said, "What?" So I am, I am ever so so humbled, and uh, and I'm well, an we're humble. We're all humble to to hear from you. Today I'm an well. imperfect vessel. That has cracks in its armor. But that's all right. I'll take it. You know, I say you're, I say you're less. 
I'd say you're less imperfect than most vessels. So, um, <laughs> I, I mean, maybe you've already answered this before in, in um, uh, your anecdotes. So I apologize if this is kind of overlapping, but do you see any kind of key lessons from Dr. King's journey and the Black Freedom Movement and the anti-war, anti-Vietnam War movement uh, for our present day? Oh, absolutely. I run the risk of being repetitive. No, please. Uh, Power well, can seize. No, no. Power can seize nothing without a demand. Okay. The other side of that is that somehow, somehow, sometime, there comes a the point in time where there has to be a, 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 a steel rod of courage. Okay. This uh, a, 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 exemplified by a person. And so, you know, Dr. King was influenced by people like Abraham Joshua Heschel and, uh, and uh, the Yale, the, the people from the Yale Divinity School uh, on the question of Vietnam, for example. Um, and he was a, um, I, I, it sounds corny. It sounds so corny that it doesn't even sound like we could even waste time talking about it. But you have to believe in something. You have to believe in something that is so morally non-negotiable. You hear what I'm saying? Yes, sir. I, I don't think that's corny at it's all. so morally non-negotiable. I don't think it's corny it's at all. It's got to be so yeah. deeply embedded in your soul, okay? That you can look at the world and say, bring it on. I love that. I love that. I think it's, I think my personal, I feel the same way. I think it's very easy to be cynical. I think it's very easy to think nothing works and to think everything, um, everything around you is destined to fail. It's harder to work for success. It's easy to predict failure, you know? So I personally don't think that's corny at all. I think believing in something. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. It, and so, but in direct, just a little bit, is that the Black Lives Matter movement uh, The Black Lives Matter movement is a, uh, is a moral and political reflection of the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr to the extent that the Black Lives Matter movement remains a disciplined, nonviolent movement, it will be like the capstone commemoration of the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. He would look, you know, when he, on April 3rd, when he was speaking in the Teva, in the, Tabernacle in Memphis, Tennessee. And he said, I've looked, I've been to the mountaintop and I looked on over and I've seen, and I've, and I, and I've seen the mountaintop. He could, I looked over and I've seen the tips of the Black Lives Matter movement. I've seen what's gonna come afterwards. And so that my young, brothers and sisters who were involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, I, I appreciate that you get some moral and political nourishment from what we try to do. And I look at what they have done and are doing, I look on it humbly but I also look on it with the spirit of admiration to know there's no way in hell that the Black Lives Matter movement could be doing what they're doing today, but for the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I absolutely couldn't agree more and legacy of yourself as well, part of that. Um, and many, many other civil rights leaders. 
Um, I, I, I just have three questions left and they're all kind of future facing. Um, so this is kind of, I guess, where we, I, I would like to kind of channel your experience into helping the next generation of people. I think the first generation I would, uh, I, I think we're kind of curious about, since everyone watching this is a lawyer or going to law school, um, what, what advice do you have for young people who are interested in addressing racism, poverty, and militarism in our society? Um, even if they don't go to law school, um, do you have any advice for people who, young, younger people who are interested, who care, you know, but don't know where to start? Yes. Divide the total number of hours in a week that you're awake and cut them in half and they give half of them to reading and studying the history of before and do not become consumed and totally dedicated to what is called the internet. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there is a history. We are the, the the internet is meant to be a tool, not intended to be in and of itself. I mean, how can you be a user of the internet and not know about? Uh, I mean, you got to know. You know. I mean, you got to know something about the actual history of what happened. So you have the internet as a tool, which means you have to read. You no, know, I, I asked someone the other day, when was the last time you read a book? <laughs> Excuse me? No, I mean, I mean, I mean, actually read a book. I'm not talking about some little novel. You actually read a book. <laughs> you know? You're sheepish. You know? But what is a book? a book? What is a book? A book is someone who's taken the time to sit down and reflect about what has going on around them or before and written it down to interpret it. Well, what is a book? Is that an app? What is that? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, so that's the first thing I would say. Uh, the second thing I would say is read Schopenhauer on morality. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, no, I, I think it's a good thing. I agree there with you. I, I think it's a big like, ask. <laughs> There's something called, I mean, read, there is something, look, you cannot have something that is both, something is either moral or immoral. They cannot exist at the same time. Hmm? That's why oh, I yeah, said no, Schopenhauer has a great discussion about this. Yeah, no, I love that. That's very, you gave, you gave some very specific advice to young people, which is good, because I think at that age, I think people need a bit more specificity. I mean, go back to the great, go back to one of the great uh, uh, persons in, in, in literature, Tolstoy. He says, you want to understand what goes on in any society, first see how they treat their children, how they treat their old people, and how they treat their people in prison. That's the measure of how a society is if you look at those three things. Well, it sounds like we don't need to read the book anymore. You just summarized it for us. So thanks so much. Oh, please. <laughs> um, uh, I, so the, the second generation I wanted to ask you about was, uh, so that what, what you just said was for people who uh, are not in law school. Do you have any advice for, pe for the younger people who are in law school and uh, uh, how they can like practice law, or use their legal skills to change and strengthen democracy and make our society more equitable, equitable and just. So this is for people who okay. are currently in law school. Okay. Look at law school pragmatically as you're developing the skill sets as a tool. Going to law school is like you're developing to become a fine alchemist. Okay. <laughs> you're, 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 it's, it's a tool only. It's not something in and of itself. It's an investigative and evaluative tool to use for all the information that presumably you would get if you read history <laughs> and presumably if you listen. But going to, now if you say, well, I'm going to go to law school because I want to make a million dollars. Okay, that's a good, good objective. I mean, you know, that's, that's I can't, I can't say that that's not, an objective to pursue, 
But if you if that's your only objective, I'm going to say that when you get to law school, you're going to be an uneducated, wealthy millionaire. <laughs> Ignorant. I mean, uh, you never, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I'm not, no, ho ho hold on. Uh, I remember, I remember the first time I read uh, uh, a textbook on property in law school. And I said to myself, I said, these are some, these are some serious, skillful dudes. <laughs> they developed a whole set of laws to, to keep and protect property. That if you've got an acquired property, they developed a whole set of rules that nobody was going to be able to take it away. I got, I got that quickly. Okay. And then I also understood that in the, in the law, on the, on, on the, it was evidence, evidence. If you're going to get into the battle, if you're going to get into the arena, you got to develop a skill set about evidence. Okay. You got, I mean, I mean, I remember Jack Weinstein, who was becoming, became a judge in the Eastern District of Court. His classic book that was taught in law school was on evidence, one of the things earlier. You also have to have a, a dialectically healthy respect and disrespect for the law. I love that. Okay. You got to have it. Uh, so I am honored. Listen, I am, first of all, I'm honored that I was able to get up this morning and go to the bathroom by myself. <laughs> no, that's something that, that's something that Trevor Noah would probably say. <laughs> by the way, uh, give him my warmest he, regards. I will give him my regards, and I can tell you he has no problem going to the bathroom. I've, <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, he's he, that's that's not his uh, weakness. <laughs> right. Um, the uh, so um, uh, the 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 final group of people, well, the second to last group of people, I wanted to hear your um, your thoughts on were um, what do you have? A, what advice do you have for the lawyers who have graduated from law school for a while now? They have reached accomplishment in their professional careers. And now they want to have a greater social impact before they retire. Maybe they want as diligent in their social justice in their careers, but they've kind of hit a point where they understand that that's more important now and they want to go into it. Uh, do you have any advice for those lawyers? There's an old labor union song. Which side are you on, boy? Which side are you on? There's an old labor union song. Okay. If they are so blessed, it, go, it goes back to what I called the Schopenhauer. There are no two sides to the question of morality. So if they are so fortunate as to have applied their skill sets to, to get an amount of economic security, they have to go and look in the mirror and say, uh, well, they will look in the mirror and say, what do they want to do today? What, when they look in the mirror, they have to ask themselves, what value have I contributed other than another thousand dollars an hour to my, to my, to my bank account, you know? Because it's all about money, then it means nothing, okay? It's about values values and in this case after we've had a we've had something that i never thought would ever occur i never thought that ever there would be a challenge to something called facts i'm old-fashioned i mean i mean i mean you don't have to be 90 years old i mean i i i mean i really thought when you said facts you said facts you know what I mean? I mean, I, I mean, I didn't know that there was an alternative to two plus two equaling four. I didn't know that there was an alternative. You hold something up, it drops, it doesn't go up. I don't know. I thought it had been settled that the world was round. 
I thought it had been settled by investigative tools that the speed of light is 180 miles per second, 180,000 miles per second. I thought those things had been settled. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, reality is a bit up for grabs these days. Um... So the, the, the very thing is, real, how can reality by definition be up for grabs? No enough book reading. For example, no enough. No, even no, even no enough. Get, look, look, did segregation exist? Yes or no? If segregation existed, then it had certain factual historical consequences. Yes, it did. Okay. Now, one of those consequences was that there was an, 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 an economic disparity, dislocation between the accumulated wealth of those people who had been enslaved and the slave owners. Now, that is not an opinion. <laughs> I mean, don't give me some bullshit about that's not an opinion. That's a matter of historically demonstrated empirical facts. Sure. Absolutely. And and I, I do think that um you know having a conversation face to face instead of on the argument uh instead of just on the in the comment section on the internet i mean i i just can't put my foot in my mouth because we are technically talking over the internet but at least we're talking face to face like human beings yes. um it, 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 oh, i'm glad it that really, you are on the internet you bring some soul to it brother thank you oh well i'm, I'm trying to not, not as much soul as uh <laughs> as you but I'm, i'll try to bring a bit of spice to this but but um just being able to talk to each other like this is uh, a great way to learn more about the world and history with an open mind. And I think it's easy to kind of lose your mind on the internet comment section. It's a lot harder to lose your mind when you're looking someone in the eye, like I am right now and hearing your voice and hearing your experiences and hearing the truth of your experiences and the value of it. Um, and I think, um, I, I hope, you know, I hope more people will be, will, will, will be able to do that instead of, uh, just kind of commenting online. Well, I am humbly and, honored. I am honored. Um, no, the honor is mine. You know, <laughs> the honor is mine. You get to be 90 years old, you get besieged by all sorts of medical things and so forth. And, uh, you know, I say I woke up this morning and I was blessed. This is a, this is a day that uh, who, who, who would have thought that uh, the only child of domestic household servants 90 years ago, born. Who would have thought that in 2021 that I'd be sitting on, I'd be sitting on this technology called the internet <laughs> talking to a Ronnie Chang? Who would have thought of that? Uh, I mean, I mean, that's, that's incredible, right? It, it, it is truly incredible. And um, yeah, thank you so much for speaking to us. There, there's not a man, woman, or child in America white, black, Asian, or Middle Eastern, whatever your race and ethnicity is, there's no one in America who doesn't owe a debt of gratitude to you uh, and the things you fought for and the things you continue to fight for. Um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, but I, they owe a derivative debt of gratitude. The gratitude they owe is to the greatest person in the 20th century. I am a derivative beneficiary of having spent most of the seven and a half years from the second week in February until April 4th, 1968, working as his personal lawyer and draft speechwriter. This is a gift. If you took all of the wealth of Bezos and all of the wealth of I don't know, Apple, all of the wealth of technology, and you set them at my feet and said, you can have all of this, Dr. Jones. You can have all of this in exchange for giving up those seven and a half years. And I would say, you don't have enough money, brother. There's not enough money in your checking account. No, absolutely. And look, Dr. Jones, you're very humble. Okay, you don't want to call yourself the savior of America. That's fine. I'll do it for you. 
Thank you for saving all of us. And yes, oh, you please, are I'm not saving. I didn't save anybody. I just saved <laughs> yes, my own soul. Part, you are part of a team. Yes, you worked with very yes. remarkable people. Yes, but you also did the work and you also showed up and did it. And okay, maybe it was luck of the universe that you were in the right place at the right time. But either way, you still did it. So thank you. I'm going to thank you. I need everyone, to send, I need, I need, you, I need to is gonna thank you. I need to. I need to send this to my four children, five children. <laughs> they remember that they do have a father. Yeah, that they should respect. No, they respect me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, thank you, Doctor Jones. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you, and I am so so honored. As again, no, uh, you'll see my remarks to the ABA when I receive the award. I'm 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 I'm, uh, I'm honored. What can I say? I get to the point of uh, ridiculous redundancy. Thank you. The honor is mine to speak to you. And again, thank you on behalf of um, everyone in America, minorities and the majority. We, we, all, we, all, we all benefit greatly from, from your life and your work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you so much.